a lot of the prophetic oracles that don't deal with the future at all. So it would be rather reductionistic to say prophecy is telling the future. There's mm -hmm. too much of it that has nothing to do with that. It, you know, many, many people come to the conclusion that the New Testament writers, because they're inspired, must be getting the correct interpretation of the Old Testament text. The New Testament authors aren't interpreting. They're mm -hmm. applying, they're redeploying, they're, they're appropriating, they're mm -hmm. doing something else. We make a mistake if we think that they're trying to tell us what the prophet meant in his context. <laughs>
prophecy as a subset of divination, mm. which strikes Bible readers as weird because <laughs> we learn from the Bible, oh, divination is no, don't do divination. Absolutely not. Forbidden. Right. And yet prophecy <laughs> is such a familiar thing and a comfortable, uh, an allowable thing. So it's, it's uh, easy to see that we wouldn't necessarily associate them. But in the ancient world, that's how it works, because mm. there are all ways in which God speaks. He speaks through prophets, but in the ancient world, they also believe that he spoke through these various divination techniques. And so they're all part of the same category. Gotcha. Awesome. And could you give us a couple examples of how a prophet would speak, maybe even about the past, but you know, not even about the future, but about other things? Sure. Uh, so the you take a passage like in Hosea, and God's talking about, you remember when Israel was, was young, I brought her out of Egypt, and I made a covenant with her, and I loved her, and all of these things. That's, that's kind of talking about the past, of mm -hmm. all that God did for Israel in the past. Mm -hmm. Then it moves on to talk about the present, how Israel has been so unfaithful. And uh, so that's in the category of indictment. These are things that Israel has done wrong. And so past and present become the focus of the prophet's attention. Now, sometimes, of course, those conversations lead into, and so this is what's going to happen to you. And that's mm. the judgment oracles. Uh, so those things can kind of be linked together. But uh, again, we shouldn't uh, only be interested in the prophecies that talk about the future. We should understand the larger issue of prophecy. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay. And how did the role of prophecy or or prophets develop over the history of the Bible? So I introduced several different categories uh, in which we can think about them. Uh, we, we have a category which is typically labeled pre-classical prophecy. Uh, these are the early prophets who, whose prophecies are not recorded for us. They would be people like David. I'm sorry, uh, Deborah is what I meant to say. <laughs> Deborah uh, or um, Samuel, um, Elijah, Elisha. They're referred to as pre-classical prophets. And we don't have collections of their prophetic oracles. Then the main category that we have in the Bible is classical prophets. The classical prophets are those where we have collections of their oracles. So that's Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk and Nahum and all of those ones that have those books uh, named after them that are collections mm -hmm. of their oracles. And so we have those two categories which dominate the Old Testament. But even uh, at the end of the Old Testament period, we get into a third category called apocalyptic, which now instead of being characterized by oracles, and oracles are often introduced by formulas, like thus says the Lord. Okay, and then they say what God says. That's an oracle. Uh, that's very characteristic of classical prophets. Um, when we get to apocalyptic, instead of oracles, we have visions. And so we have visionaries. Now, at the time when we were in that period of time when apocalyptic was important, they would not have necessarily referred to those visionaries as prophets. But as time went on, people looked back on that and called them prophets. So you take somebody like Daniel. Uh, Daniel doesn't have any oracles. And Daniel would not have been referred to as a prophet in his day. But as people look back at the visions in the book of Daniel, they refer to him as a prophet. And eventually, anybody who was believed to be involved in the writing of Scripture got labeled a prophet. So by New Testament times, they would talk about David as a prophet, uh, even though we don't have any oracles coming from him. Uh, we don't have him playing that social role. So again, things are shifting in how the definition works. Hmm. Um, people in the New Testament like Anna or Simeon uh, would be considered giving prophetic messages. Of course, John the Baptist. Uh, so they are giving prophetic messages, though it's not of the oracle type that we would find in Isaiah or Jeremiah. And eventually even we find the development of prophecy as a spiritual gift, which is yet a different kind of phenomenon. So mm -hmm. the, the word tends to, to shift and grow and, 
uh, change. Uh, and so we have to recognize that, that it's not all the same thing going on. Um, but all of them have in common the idea that they're speaking a word from God in one kind of form or another. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so could you briefly talk about that, the idea of prophecy as a spiritual gift? You said it's almost something's different about it. Could you talk about what you see as different? Sure. Uh, the prophecy that's a spiritual gift is not giving oracles. It's trying to give insight into what God is doing. Uh, hmm. So... Uh, when our pastors preach, they're trying to offer insight about what God is doing. They're trying to speak a word from God. And of course, sometimes we might say, well, I'm not sure that's a word from God, but uh, <laughs> that's sort of what the office is uh, intending to do. But that's, mm. that's very different from what we find in the classical prophets. Mm. So are you saying that when New Testament writers talk about the gift of prophecy, that it's not specifically about telling the future, that it could be as simple as just like a sermon talking about what the Bible says? Uh, sure, exhortation. Huh. Uh, so uh, I would not see the gift of prophecy as having to do with telling the future. Again, as I've said, I don't even think that that's what classical prophecy was largely about. Mm. Uh, sometimes yeah. it involved the future, but that's not what prophecy was. And so, um, you know, the prophets, um, the prophets in the Old Testament, the classical prophets, they, they issued indictment, they gave instruction. And a pastor exhorting his congregation today might do the same thing. Here are mm. some things you're doing wrong. Here's ways to fix it. Here's what you can do right. So two of the categories of prophetic oracle in the Old Testament, indictment and instruction, are forms of exhortation. So again, it's uh, trying to understand the broader picture of what prophecy is. Well, yeah, that's really interesting because if we assume prophecy is a specific thing, and then we get to the New Testament and say, "Hey, you know, they give the the gift of prophecy, or or they have that ability," then we're going to assume, "Hey, that gift must be about telling the future," when right. it could be a lot different than that. That's really fascinating. Okay, and you also talked about David as a prophet, so. Can you help our audience understand why someone like David would ever be seen as a prophet? And you, and you, I get, does that have to do with another misconception about what prophecy is? It really just has to do with shifting terminology. Okay. If a prophet is someone who has a word from God to speak, mm -hmm. okay, um, David didn't serve that sociological function where he was giving prophetic oracles and things of that sort, mm -hmm. but as he became recognized as the one who wrote some of the Psalms and Psalms became considered Holy Scripture, then his Psalms were speaking a word from God. Mm -hmm. So again, the category prophet expanded um, to, to en encompass uh, people like David who were associated with writing Scripture. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so what about covenant? What role did covenant play in prophecy and, and just prophets in general? Well, in the book, I make a big point that the classical prophets are basically champions of the covenant. <laughs> um, that That is the focus of much of their attention. Uh, they're trying to uh, call the people back to covenant faithfulness. Uh, they are trying to indict the people for how they are failing to keep the covenant. And the judgment oracles that they pronounce are sometimes uh, can be connected to the covenant curses that we have in Deuteronomy. And so in that sense, the, the, uh, the prophets are giving God's word concerning covenant adherence in Israel. And so in that sense, almost everything in the classical prophets, we can read through the lens of the covenant. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that brings up an interesting question, because if they are basing their their prophecy or, you know, I guess their commands, their their speech to Israel, if they're basing that off of, of the covenant curses and blessings, then what does that say about like, what we can tell about, you know, was this a direct message from God or were they just looking at the covenant curses and be like, hey, you know, this is what's going to happen if you don't listen, because this is what God already told us. 
Well, they present it as a message from God. Um, it's very difficult to find the lines between what is their role as uh, social commentator, so to speak, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, the ones giving a message. We have the, the inter interesting example <clears throat> in Second uh, Samuel uh, after the no, I'm sorry, yeah, Second Samuel seven, um, where David says that he would like to build a temple. You know, why do I live in this wonderful palace and God lives in a tent? I want to build a temple. And Nathan, who's his, his court prophet, of course, there were such things both in the Bible and in the ancient world. Nathan, they were advisors to the king. So Nathan, his court prophet, says, by all means, go ahead, build your temple. Well, then as we read in the chapter, we find out that um, overnight, Nathan gets a little visit from God who says, um, no, that's not what I was saying. <laughs> Um, I I don't think David should build a temple, and uh, and then here's my word. And so instead of David building a house for God, God is going to build a house for David, his dynasty. <clears throat> hmm. So there we find the interesting situation where where Nathan seems to be working out of his um, intuition, which he expects to be informed by God. But it turns out it wasn't. Uh, so that that gives us pause for thought. But yeah. still, um, it's just like in scripture. We, you know, how do you sort out divine agency and human agency? Mm. You know, they're kind of a big mix because this is God's word inspired. Yet He used humans uh, in the production of it. And so, uh, what parts God and what parts human? And how could you tell the difference? And how did how did that work? And did they hear voice? You know, all of those questions. It's really the same kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay. So in your book, you talked about the difficulty of determining what is false prophecy. I can just think of when, you know, I'm a kid in church and, and they give you like, this is what the Bible says about what is false prophecy. And this is how we determine it. And that's how they figured out who was going to be a prophet in that day. Um, could you talk about some challenges in determining, you know, what false prophecy is? as as well as what your solution to that is right well the the main core of false prophecy is if you prophesy in the name of another god or if you uh, are encouraging the people to turn away from yahweh to other gods mm -hmm. or if you are encouraging the people to um to violate the covenant uh, the, i mean those would be the obvious mm -hmm. cases of false prophecy but we also find a case of false prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, where his antagonist, Hananiah, is prophesying in the name of Yahweh. So it's not another God. Uh, and he's prophesying to Israel. And he basically is telling them, you know, God's punished us, but that's over now. Everything's OK. And you're all right. I'm OK. You're OK. And so that's that's his prophetic message. Jeremiah, of course, on the other hand, is also prophesying in the name of Yahweh and saying, no, it is not OK. And <laughs> you've only seen the beginning of this and it's going to get far worse before it gets better. Don't get lackadaisical. Don't become comfortable. You're still covenant violators. OK, now, obviously, at that point, we would consider Hanani the false prophet. And eventually, Jeremiah condemns him and tells mm -hmm. him that he's going to die within the year. And he does. Uh, so mm -hmm. that one kind of clears. Uh, clears up as as time goes on, but the people wouldn't have known that Hananiah was false prophecy. Mm. I mean, it wasn't like he was speaking in another god or telling them to worship other gods. What he was doing was not being clear about how they still needed to fix things. Um, Jeremiah was telling them, "You're you're still violating the covenant." Han and I was saying, you're okay. And that's really the sense of that falseness. And of course, the people would rather listen to Hananiah about that. You always would rather hear everything's good instead of everything's going to be horrible. So that's also an element where false prophecy comes in. Mm -hmm. We can't really talk about a false prophecy as one that doesn't come true. I'll get back to Deuteronomy 18 in a minute because that's important there. But let's let's back into that. Um, 
Jonah prophesied to Nineveh that they'd be destroyed in 40 days. They weren't, but he wasn't a false prophet. We find out in that case that even though Jonah did not lay out conditions or even give instruction, that because Nineveh responded, God changed his mind. Okay, so what we find is that in, in, in judgment prophecies, they were almost always considered semi-conditional. That is that if you changed, if you responded, if you started being faithful, that there could be some hope that the judgment would not come. So in that sense, you can't judge false prophecy by the fact that it didn't happen. So in that sense, uh, we, we recognize the conditionality issue. There's another sense. That is, sometimes it looks like prophecy has not come true. But that only means that it's going to come about later on. Uh, a good example is Habakkuk. Habakkuk um, makes it pretty obvious that he thought that the Assyrians were going to bring the ultimate judgment on Judah. The Assyrians, of course, had had defeated the northern kingdom, Israel, and had deported them, take them into exile. And Habakkuk was expecting the same kind of thing to happen to Judah. And it didn't. You know, Judah had some problems with, with Assyria, but they weren't conquered by Assyria and deported and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And Habakkuk almost seems to be a little disappointed about that. You know, like, wait a minute, oh, what's, what's going here? Are they going to get a free pass? And the message of God to Habakkuk is, no, this is not going to be fulfilled by the Assyrians, as everyone was thinking. It's going to be fulfilled by the Babylonians. Okay, that's a shift. Okay, you can't say, well, it was false prophecy because it didn't happen, wasn't fulfilled by the Assyrians. It was fulfilled by the Babylonians. The idea that fulfillment might be different than we think, might take place differently than what we expect, might happen at a different time period than what we we're looking at, all means that it's not really easy to talk about false prophecy. It can always get bumped to a future time, to a different direction. Mm. So again, those things make it very difficult to talk about false prophecy. Um, it could always still happen, you might say. So we have to go back to Deuteronomy 18, because Deuteronomy 18 suggests that the reason, the way that you can tell between a true prophet and a false prophet is that uh, what he says comes true. Hmm. And as I said, we just saw that that's a little bit of a complicated idea. Hmm. And that's why most people working with Deuteronomy 18 have concluded that it, re it pertains particularly to short-term prophecies of judgment. Hmm. Uh, because otherwise, I mean, if the fulfillment is not going to come for three generations, that doesn't help you know whether the prophet is true or not. <laughs> You're not going to be alive. So we have to take all of those factors into consideration as we understand the nuances of Deuteronomy mm. 18. Mm. Yeah, I see. So specifically uh, diving into Habakkuk and his, I guess, prophecy. So you, so just, just to be 100% clear, you're saying that uh, we have a text where it, Habakkuk says, hey, the Assyrians are going to, uh, you know, be the the ways in which this prophecy gets fulfilled and Israel gets taken. Um, but is that correct? No, no. Okay. Uh, Habakkuk doesn't say that. Uh, he would have read previous prophets as having said that. Okay. And so he expects it. Okay. And when it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. now he's distraught. Okay. Interesting. So does that mean? So, so I guess that dives into the question of those previous prophets who said that some people would think, hey, if the if these previous prophets said, hey, Israel is going to be taken by Assyria, like that's a specific claim taken and by Assyria, and that's a specific prophecy. And then you're saying that they were taken, but not by Assyria. So that seems like that means that it wouldn't have been completely fulfilled. Only half of it would be fulfilled. So maybe can you dive into deeper into exactly why 
you're not considering that wrong to to okay. say that those previous prophets said that? Is it just that the original claim wasn't actually specifically about Assyria? So uh, you go to Isaiah, and mm -hmm. in the early portions of Isaiah, Assyria is the threat. And so it talks about judgment coming from the Assyrians. Hmm. Okay. It doesn't say the Assyrians are going to take the southern kingdom of Judah into exile. But it talks about Assyria as the hand of God to bring judgment. Uh, it talks about uh, exile that is coming. But of course, it's only the northern kingdom that's taken into exile. But when the northern kingdom experiences that judgment, you can see that people would expect that the same would happen to the southern kingdom. Hmm. So it's not as if the very thing that he said didn't happen. It's that anybody reading it in Isaiah's time would have thought that. Now, Habakkuk comes a century later. And hmm. when Habakkuk comes along, the Assyrian Empire is fading from the scene. And now he's saying, what's up? You know, <laughs> obviously, at this point, they're not going to bring judgment on us. But but everyone read Isaiah as if the Assyrians were going to be the instrument of, of judgment. And of course, eventually in even Isaiah, uh, God tells Hezekiah that it's the Babylonians who are going to do that. But that's, that's a shift in expectations. So it's not so much that what they said was something that was wrong. It was rather that it set up expectations that people would have thought fulfillment was going to take place in certain ways. Um, there are a couple places where it seems to people that uh, that the prophecy is was not fulfilled. Uh, I mentioned a couple of them in the book. Uh, one of them is uh, at one point in Isaiah, he makes it seem like the northern kingdom is going to return uh, as, as Israel did when they came out of slavery in Egypt. Mm-hmm. And people look at that and they say, that never happened. Yeah. So again, that there's something a little more specific. And we have to say, okay, what's going on here? How are we reading prophecy? And again, I dealt with those at length in the book. We don't need to go through the details here. Very cool. All right. So uh, another thing. So can you talk about how prophets were not typically authors, as well as the steps that it uh a prophecy might go through until it comes to you know the the text we have today sure so aside from an, an exceptional case with jeremiah the prophets are not described as as writers that makes sense because in the ancient world it's a hearing dominant culture not a text dominant culture and we can see that all through the prophets they are speaking <laughs> Thus says the Lord, they're, they're at the temple, they're outside the gates, they're, they're, they're speaking. And so it never portrays them as writers. Jeremiah dictates part of his, uh, a number of his oracles to Baruch because he's been banned from the temple courts and from the palace. And so he can't get in there to speak. So he gives the oracles for Baruch to write down so that Baruch can read them, speak them. Okay, so the prophets are speakers they're not writers they are the um, they are the agent for presenting this word from god mm -hmm. but someone else gathers all of those oracles together into the books that we have now you could say well maybe the prophet could do that himself maybe he could but we don't get any indication that they did maybe it could have been his disciples uh, if the prophets had disciples, and it seems like they did. Isaiah 8 seems to mention them in passing. So maybe the people who came after, okay, gathered those oracles together. Uh, maybe it was the next generation where they were figuring out, boy, this guy Isaiah was really right spot on on lots of things. We better pay close attention. Let's gather all that material together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, we don't know. We don't know who gathers them together or when they do it, or what motivated that. Because again, writing is not the initial impulse in that culture. Um, things are only written down for specific reasons. I spoke about that in my book, Lost World of Scripture, if people want to learn more about it. So other people gathered these prophetic oracles and put them into the books that we have. Now, 
that's that's not just a curiosity about composition because whoever puts the book together generally exercises some purpose in doing so and that purpose is an important part of the book itself remember that when we talk about the authority of scripture we see the authority the inspiration in the graphe the written text mm -hmm. and so to that extent we could say that the prophets were moved by the holy spirit the prophets you know through the holy spirit gave god's word but when we talk about scripture we're talking about somebody else who wrote it down and it was the inspiration of scripture that produced the document arranged organized selected the way that it was in the book that constitutes the inspired word of god so i don't mean to take anything away from the prophets but we have to be careful when we talk about inspired scripture we're talking about the written product and if the written product was not necessarily the craft of the prophet then it's somebody else who's enjoying that ministry of the holy spirit to produce that written work which we now are able to read hmm. so if for instance just as an example if it was somebody in the next generation who gathered together all of the oral traditions and whatever written documents there were about uh, a prophet's oracles. Okay, then we have to ask, so who is his audience? Hmm. Uh, Isaiah is sitting there looking at people and talking to them. What about the person who compiled them all and wrote it down? He's not in front of that same audience. He's not with Jeremiah standing outside the temple right so he's got a different audience he's now thinking about a reading audience of potentially a generation later and he's doing his compositional compilation work for that audience so in that sense the reading audience should be differentiated from the audience that the prophet had when he spoke those words mm -hmm. yeah yeah so what does that say about the the detail of the actual prophetic text that we have in the Bible here? So if this is possibly many gener generations later, and if this is through oral tradition, or, you know, people recounting what the prophet said, doesn't that say something about, like, it, it wouldn't be word for word, right? They didn't worry much about word for word in the ancient world. It uh, just wasn't that much of a concern. Um, but also, balancing that, they were also very good at memorizing. Hmm. And uh, we find that there's great integrity and reliability uh, with ideas passed down through oral tradition, even through many generations. Uh, we have to remember that great epic works like uh, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad were composed orally, hmm. were transmitted orally. And that's that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines uh, in iambic pentameter. <laughs> and so we have to recognize that we're in a different world. Our text dominant world operates very, very differently. Hmm. So in that sense, um, yeah, we believe that not only were they competent to do that, but that also the Holy Spirit had some role in that. I see the Holy Spirit is involved in all the multiple steps mm. yeah yeah and it also adds to the question of i guess um yeah yeah what role does the holy spirit play so some might be some people might say hey this is the holy spirit so god could have and if it has to be inerrant then it means it has to be exactly word for word because and and you know of course you could say oh well you know that's not how they did it. But then you could always say, well, God could have done that. And since it's in there, he has to have done that. What What are your thoughts on that, specifically on that inspiration aspect? Well, remember, even when we use a strict term like inerrancy, mm -hmm. that applies to scripture, the written document. And we can't ever take that 
and compare it to what was said orally. You know, to say, oh, this is different. What Isaiah actually said orally in front of that, we, we don't have that. All we have is what the compiler has put together. Mm -hmm. But remember, this, this is no different from we have in the Gospels. We have four different Gospel writers, and they mm -hmm. sometimes report the speeches of Jesus differently. Mm -hmm. And again, the word-for-word -word issue was not as as important in those days as it as it was to us you can say the same thing a couple of different ways and still have it be the same thing mm. uh, and so again we have to recognize that we can't impose our cultural conventions and demands on the mm. text and expect it to to meet those yeah that makes a lot of sense okay so could you talk about how the audience of the prophetic books is not necessarily the audience of the prophet when prophesying so you talk about isaiah um could you talk about that a little bit Sure. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that we were just talking about. If the prophet is not the author, then somebody else is. And if somebody else is, then whatever audience they have in front of them is their particular audience. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it may, we could certainly make a case that Isaiah expects his oracles to travel beyond the people that happen to be standing in front of him. Uh, because word word passed they they spread things around uh, mm -hmm. information like that was disseminated uh, so certainly he expected his audience to be bigger than those in front of him but he still would have largely thought of his generation uh, if a later generation writes them down then they're probably thinking of its importance for their generation and certainly maybe for future generations as well yeah but here's the problem yeah. we can speculate and even say it's highly likely that the audience of the writer was different from the audience of the prophet but we don't know what the audience of the writer was because we don't know who did it when mm. right so we we can't we can't really comment on that audience we can only say that it may well have been a different one mm -hmm. uh, who had already seen history unfold a bit who have already seen some of the things that the prophet said come true, uh, who now had maybe different challenges, yet it seemed to them that the prophecies still maintained. So all of those different things. Yeah. yeah that, I mean, after all, say, when we, when we yeah. as the church read prophetic literature, okay, now we become the audience. We put ourselves in that audience. And sometimes we talk about those things as having pertinence to us. Okay, because we become a new audience. In one sense, every generation becomes a new audience to these books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of has to do with Daniel as well, right? Sure. Yeah, um, because it you, you would say it was, is written a lot later, and therefore the Daniel, or I guess the writer of the text we have for Daniel today is writing to a different audience, even though he's using, I guess, text Right. that may well, even be older or you know it's very clear by the time you get to the later chapters of daniel that the audience that that information pertains to is a second century audience mm -hmm. whether you think that daniel is projecting into that audience from centuries earlier or you think that there are compilers who are putting stuff together or whatever um mm -hmm. still he's clearly projecting to a, a an audience that's in the second century nobody mm -hmm. disagrees with that it's just a matter of how we think about composition. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely interesting and and complex. So could you talk about how the thing that was, yeah, so could you talk about how the thing that was originally prophesied in the Old Testament doesn't necessarily have to match how it was fulfilled in the New Testament? Sure, my point in, in that is that fulfillment can take place in weird and wonderful ways. Uh, it can take place in unanticipated ways. Mm -hmm. It can take place in ways that uh, you wonder how the connection would ever be drawn. Uh, one of the, the classic examples of that is Hosea 11.1. 1. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Um, and in that case, Hosea, uh, first of all, while he's a prophet, he's talking about the past. Uh, he's not talking about the future. He doesn't say anything that would sound to them to be messianic. Um, he's talking about the privilege Israel had and how they had squandered that in their unfaithfulness. And so 
people looking at that wouldn't even say there's anything that needs to be fulfilled here. It's just citing an instance from the past where God brought Israel out of Egypt. It's therefore surprising to us when we get to Matthew, and Matthew tells us, well, Hosea 11.1 1 is fulfilled when Jesus' parents bring him out of Egypt. We say, wow, didn't see that coming. Uh, how would you ever think of that? Uh, because, again, Hosea 11.1 1 is contextually talking about the past. So there's a case where fulfillment doesn't really match up with what one would expect when reading the prophecy. Mm. But that's okay. That can happen. And it happens kind of a lot in the New Testament that things don't unfold the way they might have expected. So we see this in Jesus' audience when uh, when he's not ready to kind of march against Rome and take the throne of Israel as an as an heir of David, mm -hmm. everybody's a little upset. This is not what we expected. Messianic prophecy says you're supposed to be like this. And Jesus isn't like that. And what we find is that, okay, if, if, you, had, if you had talked to somebody in the century before Jesus, a Jew, a, a learned steeped in scripture Jew and said, make up a list for me of all the things Messiah is going to do and be. Mm -hmm. And they would go to the Old Testament, they would go through the prophecies and they would make up a list. Okay. Uh, first of all, Hosea 11, 1 would not have been on it. Right. That never would have occurred to them. But second of all, of that list, almost none of them were actually fulfilled by Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. We've got that one. Okay. But almost none of them were fulfilled by Jesus because all of them had to do with his kingship on a throne of David uh, and bringing social justice against the enemies and all of those things. Uh, we have another one that was fulfilled when Jesus, of course, was reading the scroll of Isaiah and talks about caring for the poor. And that uh, the blind receive sight and the lame walk and this is fulfilled today. But, and that one might have been on their list, but not really prominently. Hmm. And so what we find is that a large percentage of the prophecies that would have been on the Messianic list prior to the time of Jesus were actually not fulfilled by him. Now, of course, we look at it and we say, well, there's a second coming of Christ and he's going to fulfill them then. Yeah. Okay, great. That didn't help the Jewish audience of the first century. In hmm. Contrast to that, if you go through the Gospels and make a list of the places where it talks about Jesus fulfilling prophecy, where it actually specifically mentions it, you'll find that many of those passages would not have been on the list. It would not have been considered messianic, would, would not have been seen to be talking about the future, like Hosea 11.1. 1. So it's really interesting to see how this how this works the ones that would have been on the list didn't get fulfilled the ones that weren't on the list were fulfilled you can imagine why jesus audience was a little confused yeah yeah so yeah maybe let's talk about that something like isaiah 7 14. so you know lots of people think that hey this is a prophecy about the virgin mary having jesus that seems to be what luke thinks if you look at isaiah 7 and try to read it in context you notice some unusual things uh, first of all you notice that the word he uses to describe the woman doesn't talk about whether she's had a sexual encounter or not virgin uh, rather that word in hebrew deals with someone who is who has not yet had a child well that, that's a different kind of category. Hmm. Okay, and so the woman identified there is a woman who's not yet had a child. Uh, furthermore, again, this is debatable, but as I look carefully at the Hebrew verbs and the way that verse is expressed, it looks to me like it's suggesting she already is pregnant. It's a participle. And so, again, it can't be talking about Mary 800 years in the future. Um, and the uh, then you find out when you get down to chapter 7 verses 15 16 that a child is actually born to fulfill that in isaiah's time hmm. 
so there's nothing there that anyone would have said was messianic. That wouldn't have been on the list for the person I talked about, you know, in the century before Jesus. It wouldn't have been on his list. They wouldn't have thought of it as a virgin birth. They wouldn't have thought of it as something that still needed to be fulfilled. The whole idea was in Isaiah that Isaiah's audience is going to see this happen, and that's going to persuade them that God is going to protect them from the invading armies. So when we read Isaiah in context, we have no reason to think had anything to do with those sorts of things. Now, when we read Matthew, Matthew says it's fulfilled in Jesus. Mm -hmm. But as we found with Hosea 11.1, 1, the prophet doesn't have to anticipate some sort of fulfillment for fulfillment to take place. So Matthew is giving Isaiah 7 a very different read and saying it's fulfilled according to kind of a very different scenario. And that's okay. That's, that's no, no problem. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Okay, so that makes a really interesting claim then, I guess. So as I'm reading the New Testament, I guess that should make me think, hey, if I see something in the New Testament talking about the Old Testament, that it doesn't necessarily mean that the New Testament writer is, I guess, looking at the, the original context or looking what the original writer of the Old Testament was thinking. Is that something you would agree with that? Sure, and that's the distinction I make in the book between message and fulfillment. That is, the prophet has a message. It comes to him through the Holy Spirit. Um, it's the word of God. It becomes scripture when it's put into a book, and therefore it's inspired, it's authoritative, and that's the message. It's the message that he meant, the message that his audience would have understood because he's a communicator, and you expect your audience to understand what the message is. Okay, and so for Isaiah 7, the message is, um, in the very near future, God is going to bring deliverance from these two invading armies. It's an important message. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's message. The prophet always, always knows what his message is. And he expects his audience to know it, and he expects them to respond to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's not the same as fulfillment. Fulfillment talks about how things unfold in history and what connections can be drawn, how dots can be connected. Mm. And it's the New Testament authors that help us see that. You can't connect dots until you have two dots. The Old Testament prophets only had one dot. It was a meaningful dot. It had a message. It was God's word. New Testament comes along and with things that happen with Jesus, for instance, they've got a second dot. And they draw the connecting line for us. Okay. Their message is to announce fulfillment. And that's what they do. And they're authoritative in doing that. That's God's word as well. But they're not trying to tell you what did Isaiah mean in his context. That's not their task. They're not trying to reiterate the prophet's message. They're trying to identify fulfillment, a different task entirely. And we accept their identifications of fulfillment because they also enjoy the work of the Holy Spirit in them producing inspired text. So similar to a few questions ago, how does that interact with the idea of scripture being inerrant? So... It, you know, many may, people come to the conclusion that the New Testament writers, because they're inspired, must be um, getting the the correct interpretation of the Old Testament text. But are you saying that there's two interpretations or? No, I'm two? saying that uh, the New Testament authors aren't interpreting. They're mm -hmm. applying, they're redeploying, they're, they're appropriating, they're mm -hmm. doing something else. Their job is not to give the message of the prophet. They're not trying to interpret the message of the prophet. They're mm -hmm. trying to say how that message, perhaps totally unbeknownst to the prophet, is mm -hmm. fulfilled in Jesus usually. Mm. So yeah. they have a totally different task. We make a mistake if we think that they're trying to tell us what the prophet meant in his context. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so as we're summing up here, uh, one, could you tell us where we can get your, your work, your book here, 
as well as just your your main things that you want people to take from this discussion from from your book here? Well, as always with the Lost World books, I want people to try to understand text in context, trying to read the Old Testament as an ancient document and as scripture, and that by doing so, we can get a better idea of how to read the Old Testament well. And so the Lost World of the Prophets uh, is, there we go, is just coming out. I think it launches on Amazon uh, at the end of the month. And so it's available on Amazon. You can probably get it even now through the publisher if you go to their website um, and uh, can, can get it for your very own. It follows up on lots of the principles that I've been doing in the Lost World books, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some of the things that I did in my recent book, Wisdom for Faithful Reading. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's just following along in the line of thought uh, that I've been talking about for a long time. Mm. Yeah, much appreciated. And uh, to final summarizing thoughts, what is the, the big points that you want people to take away from your book? The big point is, first of all, message is different from fulfillment. Second of all, prophets are spokespersons for deity, not people who are foretelling the future. Um, when they talk about the future, sometimes that's conditional. Sometimes it could take all kinds of different directions. We cannot plot the end times by reading the prophets because as we've learned throughout the Bible, fulfillment often takes strange trajectories, hmm. weird turns. So you can't say the Bible says this and that's what it's going to be. There's hmm. too much flex in all of this. And sometimes, even when it looks like the Bible is being very specific, actually fulfillment takes place in a very different way, as even Jesus' life and ministry show us. Hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. All right. Well, I do want to say thank you so much for coming on here. Everybody should definitely go check out your book. It was really interesting, and I definitely learned a lot from it. But otherwise, I hope you have a great rest of your day, Dr. Walton. Thanks, Zach, and thanks for the conversation. Awesome. It's been a pleasure.